great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Jonathan Hype. Um, we've been trying to get uh, John out here to give a talk for quite some time. He's a, he's a very busy guy. Uh, he's especially busy right now because um, he has his new book uh, coming out. So uh, for the next month or so, it seems like every day he's in a different city uh, giving a talk, uh, promoting it. Um, he should be on the Colbert Report in a couple weeks. Um, Um, and so John is professor of psychology at the University of Virginia and visiting professor at the Stern School of Business at New York University. And uh, John's the kind of scholar who, if you look at his educational pedigree, you can actually see the seeds of uh, his uh, subsequent trajectory, um, where his ideas have originated. Um, he uh, completed uh, his BA in philosophy at Yale, and then he went to get his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in psychology. And there he worked primarily with uh, two people. Um, one, Jonathan Barron, who is probably most known for his work on protective values, the idea that, that some values can't really be understood in terms of rational or economic prediction, that there's a strong emotional commitment to them. And then also with uh, Paul Rosen, who's the uh, world leader in the psychology of disgust. And from there, he went to uh, do a postdoc at the University of Chicago with the anthropologist Rick Schwader. Um, and who was working on the idea that there's more than one moral ethic guiding the moral reasoning of people around the world, that psychologists have uh, largely been concerned with uh, one particular moral ethic, an ethic of autonomy with concerns of justice and individual rights, and Rick Schwader's trying to expand that, and John has expanded that uh, even more, as we'll see in his talk uh, today. So I think you can see the confluence of this, uh, this intellectual um, her heritage into um, John's uh, ideas that he's been working on since. And, and John has the remarkable uh, ability to not only identify some of the most uh, important research questions, uh, especially regarding morality, um, but he consistently raises these questions in a very profound and highly memorable way such that people keep talking about them long after uh, the fact. And my own experiences with this come from uh, in my cultural psychology classes each year. I usually have one lecture where I'm talking a lot about uh, John's work. And I find that when I'm off in Vancouver and every now and then I run into a, a former student and um, they want to provide some evidence that they were, were in my class and they'll say, yes, because we talked about that stuff, always something that John had talked about, usually the idea of whether it's immoral to have sex with a dead chicken. <laughs> so uh, my most memorable moments are John's moments and, um, uh, and I, I don't think that John's students are ever able to uh, forget any of his lectures. Um, so John's one of the most cited and influential psychologists of his generation, um, and he's very much turned the field of morality upside down. And whereas before it was preoccupied primarily with concerns about how people can reason their way through moral dilemmas, and was focused on the kinds of cognitive capacities that allow for that kind of reasoning ability, um, John instead focused on the emotional response that people have um, uh, when they encounter a moral violation and then the ways that they go about rationalizing uh, the emotional response that they have uh, later. And he's focused a lot, uh, in particular, on the emotion of disgust and its key role in uh, moral reasoning. Um, and he's taken this emotion far beyond the idea of just the kind of disgust you have with thinking about bad food or, or rotting flesh and consider how it's a signal um, that uh, one has experienced a, a moral transgression. And he's extended this work um, to help explain uh, the many different kinds of moral intuitions people have. I think he'll be talking about six um, today. Um, and uh, how these intuitions guide people's uh, political persuasions. And uh, much ink has been spilled over uh, the idea about the ongoing culture wars that uh, are happening around the world and how polarized people's political views have become. Uh, people don't seem able to communicate with each other. There, there's a lot of crosstalk. Um, but if you listen closely to John here, you're going to get a, a new appreciation for um, how it is that we can make sense, say, of uh, what uh, you, the repulsive political views of, of your uncle, say, um, and uh, how it is that you might be able to talk to him, uh, that you might be able to uh, understand each other's uh, respective positions. And so his uh, new book here stands to uh, shape uh, the ongoing political discourse uh, that's happening throughout the Western world. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Jonathan Hyde. Uh, okay. Thanks. 
thanks so much, Steve, for, for that uh, wonderful introduction and also for uh, inadvertently exposing my two joke slides at the beginning of the talk. But I'll just pretend you can see those. Carry on. Um, I'm going to be talking today about um, a number of things that, that I hope are, are universal and of interest to people all over the world and uh, about a few things that are specific to, to uh, the United States. At breakfast this morning with, uh, uh, with a couple of faculty members um, talking about Canadian politics, you guys are just so reasonable. I mean, it's, um, it's really amazing to be up here. I feel as though I'm sort of on, the, you know, on the, a misty mountaintop looking down. The, the, you hear the sounds of the battle as the cannibals are all killing each other down below the great parallel. Um, so I hope that the, the, the stuff I say about uh, American politics will be of interest to you uh, for that reason. But um, in the question and answer, we've got plenty of time for discussion afterwards. I'd love to know how these uh, ideas apply uh, to the Canadian situation. I know you don't exactly have a, a culture war up here. You're very fortunate. Um, but uh, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about uh, whether these ideas can help you understand what's going on in Canada as a society. All societies are changing, diversifying. We all have to deal with questions of moral diversity. Um, so let's see what happens. So this is uh, the cover of my, of my new book. Um, and <clears throat> it's designed by the, uh, uh, the cover's designed by graphic designer Stefan Sagmeister, and I really like it because it perfectly captures what it feels like to be, to be an American certain these days. So something's ripped or torn. And actually, Steve, you didn't get this one away because I know this was on the uh, poster that advertised. This is the UK version. Uh, um, which I, I laughed at when I first saw, and briefly I thought, oh, I wish that was for the U.S. cover, but then I was, no, are you crazy? This is, I mean, I'm trying to reach out to both sides, I'm trying to not offend people here, and this is not as offensive as we can get, but I suppose the British people like to look at all sorts of things in their newspapers and magazines and so on. <laughs> um, um, so, I'm going to um, uh, try to apply some of these ideas, I'm going to give you a brief overview uh, of the book, and I'll draw out some lessons uh, for human relationships in general and also for, for uh, public policy. Um, raise your hand if you, have, if you have any interest in politics and public policy. Okay, most people. Um, well, that's good because uh, we are about to face the, uh, the greatest uh, public policy challenge that, uh, that the Earth has ever faced. Um, I don't know if you saw the news uh, was the, this morning. Astronomers at uh, Arizona State University who track asteroids uh, report that they have found uh, one of the uh, Earth-crossing asteroids that is going to, uh, uh, they expect, actually impact Earth in 10 years. Um, it's 85 miles across, which is larger than the one that did in the, the dinosaurs. And uh, it's expected to kick up a, an extraordinary cloud which will cover the Earth in blackness. Most species will go extinct. Um, so yes, this is the artist's rendition of what it will uh, look like. Um, and uh, the scientists estimate that uh, um, many species will survive and certainly will be among them because we have 10 years to prepare. So we can, on all the continents, we can dig bunkers and keep breeding populations alive uh, for, for the 10 years. Um, the, they estimate that this is what the Earth will look like when those breeding populations come up. It will look something like this um, uh, after the cloud begins to, uh, to dissipate. Um, but they say that there is, uh, uh, there is one hope. They say that if... Um, if all the countries of Earth can come up with enormous sums of money, we can build a new kind of rocket ship, a heavy lift rocket, and we can quickly test some new uh, uh, nuclear weapons that will explode in space, build a fleet of 100 of these rockets, launch them up, and we can intercept the asteroid out beyond the orbit of Jupiter, uh, detonate all the bombs at the same time, we can deflect it by a tenth of a degree, which is all you need to have it miss Earth. And if, they, if we do that, um, it, they estimate it's only a 10% chance of impact rather than 90% chance of impact. So, um, so here are the so here's the situation: 90% uh, chance of impact. Almost all of us will be killed. Uh, but if we can raise 10 trillion dollars, uh, all the countries of Earth, and do this rocket program, um, we can uh, greatly reduce the risk. Uh, but if we wait a year, then it's going to be much uh, uh, much more expensive because uh, we'll have to uh, intercept it closer in, um, and the odds of success will be worse. So, what do you think? Do you think that, uh, would you guys be in favor, I suppose Canada's share is three quarters of a trillion dollars, would you guys be in favor of cutting, you know, health care, education, everything else that has to be done, and, uh, in, in, and investing in this uh, gigantic uh, pan-Earth effort? Raise your hand if you would be willing to cut lots of other stuff to do this. Okay. And raise your hand if you would not. Okay. I'll get to you guys in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> now, um, so what this, what this really is here is a very, very easy, public policy problem. It's big, you know, a lot of, lot of dollars. But psychologically, it's a great problem because um, it recruits the psychology necessary to solve it. 
That is, if we really were facing annihilation as a planet, that would activate uh, psychological systems that make us all pull together as a team, uh, we'd have peace and harmony on Earth, uh, and we'd all work together uh, afterwards. If we were able to avert it, probably there would be no more racism, war, genocide, uh, or parking tickets forever and ever. Um, uh, things would be great. Um, now, that's an easy one. Now, I'm going to give you two really hard problems. Um, because, in a sense, there really are two asteroids headed for the Earth, and by really, I mean metaphorically. Um, and the, uh, so the first one, uh, the first one, not surprisingly, is, is global warming. I was at the TED conference last month, and we saw a talk uh, by James Hansen. He's the NASA scientist who wrote one of the first papers predicting global warming would happen in 1981 in science. And his predictions seem to have come about just as he said. And he is extremely concerned. He was censored by the Bush administration for um, speaking his mind. <coughs> and has since then become much more of an activist trying to spread the alarm. Uh, what he told us was that uh, the models, uh, you've seen these sorts of graphs here, these are the models that predict, this is how the carbon dioxide level has uh, risen from 1900 through our present time, and those are the various project projections. The bottom one is if we do nothing, if we, if we could stop CO2, if we, no more CO2 at all, that's where things would stabilize, we'd just have, and then we'd have a slight rise in Earth's temperatures. But if we, and if we do nothing, it'll just go on our current path, we'll have the red line, and Hansen told us about all the different feedback models, how if carbon dioxide does go up on that uh, trajectory, the official prediction is a five meter rise in sea levels by the end of the century, but he thinks it would actually be much worse because you get, it doesn't, he says it doesn't fully account for all the feedback levels. You know, as, you, as Arctic ice shrinks, you have more black surface on the Earth that absorbs still more sun, which then melts still more ice. Um, so he, he thinks it could be uh, as high as 15 meters uh, of uh, rise in sea levels, and this is what Florida, uh, would look like it would mostly be underwater. Uh, all of the populated areas would have to move to Orlando and climb on top of the uh, tallest uh, uh, amusement park rides there. Um, so uh, an absolute disaster uh, facing us. Um, well, it, when I ask this question to American audiences, there are actually some divergence of opinion. There may not be a single divergence of opinion here, but let's try it. First, um, uh, at least in, in the United States, it matters tremendously what your politics is. It's almost a perfect predictor. So let's see, here in this room, how many of you would describe yourselves as being on the left or liberal end of the spectrum? Please raise your hand. Okay, and liberals, how many of you would favor um, uh, uh, going even further than the Canadian government does? A massive expenditure to, uh, to combat global warming. Raise your hand if you would favor that. And liberals, uh, how many of you would not favor it? One. Okay, so it's an almost perfect return on the liberal side. Now let's see, how many people here are conservative or right of center? One. Two. Okay, so this is just, so this is actually exactly the same uh, numbers I get in the United States. Whenever I have a vaguely academic audience, it's always one or two, sometimes zero. Uh, once had three. Um, we can't exactly do a significant significance test here, but the two of you conservatives, uh, do you support making an enormous national investment in Canada to uh, combat global warming, even if it distorts the economy? Raise your hand if you support it. The two of you. Okay, one, and raise your hand if you oppose it. Okay, so the conservatives are split 50-50, roughly. Um, <laughs> uh, the liberals are all in, all in favor. Now, um, so this, as a public policy problem, it, it's, well, it doesn't seem to be all that hard in other countries, but in America, it's, it's very hard because it's gotten caught up in the culture war. So it doesn't recruit, uh, uh, we can talk about whether it was Al Gore politicizing it or what, but once it got caught up in, as a, as a left-right issue, that guaranteed that the United States would not be able to act on it. Um, I shouldn't say guaranteed, I mean, there are, you know, we came close at times, but it made it difficult to act because it recruited psychological systems that block a solution. Um, okay, now, uh, here's another hard problem. So I, I get back from the TED conference, and then the next week I go to Washington, D.C. Uh, to have dinner with some conservative um, uh, editors and newspaper writers. Uh, I wanted them to see my book, and I was hoping that they would review it favorably, and I knew one of them is this man named Yuval Levin, uh, who edits a journal called National Affairs, and he had wrote this extraordinary article called Beyond the Welfare State, um, in which he argues that uh, uh, welfare societies are basically uh, uh, unsustainable, and that's now becoming clear. Now, I'll be, I'll be interested to get your reaction, because you guys might just have the one on Earth that actually is sustainable. Um, uh, but here is a, here's the introductory paragraph from this article, and it really, you know, from just reading the newspaper, what's happening in Europe, and seeing the budget situation in the United States, uh, it just it, uh, really hit me. He says, all over the developed world, 
nations are coming to terms with the fact that the social democratic welfare state is turning out to be untenable. The reason is partly institutional. The administrative state is dismally inefficient and unresponsive. The reason is also partly cultural and moral. The attempt to rescue the citizen from the burdens of responsibility has undermined the family, self-reliance, and self-government. But in practice, it is above all fiscal. The welfare state has turned out to be unaffordable, dependent upon dubious economic and demographic, uh, oh, it is dependent upon dubious economics and the demographic model of the bygone era. And these are the extraordinary budget deficits we're seeing in, in Europe <coughs> and in the United States. Um, now, on uh, page three uh, of, of his paper, he showed me this graph, which uh, is a very interesting graph. Uh, I just want to walk you through it. It shows the national debt in the United States as a percentage of GDP. And so, as you can see, in 1790, it's quite high um, because that was the Revolutionary War, and then uh, uh, the American colonists paid off the debt. And then you can see it goes up back to that same level uh, for the Civil War, which is a very extraordinarily expensive and destructive undertaking. And then we pay off the debt, and it goes back up for World War I. And then it begins to go down, but you hit the Great Depression, it goes back up. And then you hit World War II, which of course is the biggest uh, war in history, and so it spikes way, way up. And then it goes down, and we're paying it off. And then what happens? Um, well, the dotted line there is the retirement of the baby boomers. It was easy to fight World War II, but paying for health care for the baby boom in America is, is going to vastly exceed the burdens of all the wars we've ever fought. How do we get into this situation? Um, now, uh, um, I don't know if the situation is the same in Canada. I imagine it's not nearly as, I'm sure it's not nearly as bleak. Um, this is a self-inflicted injury in many, many ways, that, uh, on right and left. The right slashing taxes, the left passing, uh, uh, passing social programs in which they uh, hide the true cost. As the right does too, everybody hides the true cost. Uh, but we have just done a disastrous job and dug our own grave. Um, you might notice that this graph, uh, oh actually I'm here, this is what the projection is. Uh, this is what American cities are gonna look like in 2030. Um, you'll notice that we're all speaking Greek. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, some economists have projected out the situation in 2050, and it looked like this. <laughs> That's, by the way, Toronto is Bosch, if you don't, don't know why. Um, so one really interesting thing to me, seeing these two graphs at the same time, you know, within a week of each other, you know, I got back from Ted, the Earth is going to be destroyed by, not destroyed, you know, we're going to have massive disasters from global warming, and I get that, no, America's going to be destroyed by its own welfare state and debt. Um, it's basically the same graph. Um, and uh, I mean that not just in, I mean, the x and y axes are, are very different, but the moral import of the graphs are identical. Uh, both, both graphs point the finger at the other side. So I'm going to translate the top graph for you into moral terms. This is what it says. That's what my book is about. All right. Um, in, uh, in 1975, Edward O. Wilson, uh, the uh, ant specialist and, and the founder of sociobiology, predicted that uh, someday soon ethics would be taken out of the hands of philosophers and biologicized, that is, given over to natural scientists who might make progress where philosophers had made uh, little progress in the centuries and even millennia uh, before, before that. Um, I believe that Wilson's prophecy has come true. The last 10 years has, has witnessed an extraordinary convergence of research in the social sciences and natural sciences on morality. Many of you have read Franz de Waal, or you've looked at fMRI studies, you know about fMRI studies. Um, uh, there's great developmental studies showing that even babies understand fairness. There's all this convergence of research. And so in my book, I try to summarize the field, where I think we are, what I think we, we know, um, in three simple principles. And if you get these, if you understand these three principles, this is most of what you need to know about moral psychology. I'm hopeful that this will help people analyze anytime you think that, uh, that uh, your political opponents or your crazy uncle is, you know, is just you know, wrong or evil, you can apply these ideas and you can see what's going on. So we'll just go through them and I'll draw out a few lessons from each one. The first is intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. Um, so many of you have encountered, uh, if you take a philosophy course, this idea that the, the, the self is divided, Plato had a metaphor that the, uh, the soul is divided, uh, like a charioteer trying to steer two horses, the noble passions and the base passions. So reason is the charioteer, the passions are the two horses, uh, and the job of philosophy is to teach young men to control their passions, and uh, if they don't do that, they will come back in the next life as women. Uh, so <laughs> um, when I was in graduate school, as, as Steve said, I, I began to uh, be interested in all this crazy, irrational, emotional stuff that we do. And I resonated much more with David Hume, uh, the, philosophy, the uh, 18th century English philosopher who famously said, 
Reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions, and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. But instead of the awful word slave, I think servant is really a better word. A slave can never speak back that to his master. A servant can sometimes object, can sometimes raise problems, especially if we think of the servant as being like a press secretary. Uh, the press secretary's job is to explain the president's and the prime minister's uh, views to the press. Um, you will, you've seen, I assume you, you have the same thing here, you have uh, press conferences and you see the press uh, perhaps debating or, or arguing with the press secretary. Uh, have you ever seen the press secretary say, oh my goodness, that's a good point, I'll go tell the prime minister. That, that can't happen, uh, because that's not the way the system is, is set up. And I think that it's the same with moral intuition and moral reasoning, um, largely. Although sometimes reasoning, well, well, reasoning can do a few things, but for the most part, it's best to see reasoning as a servant of the intuitions. And so rather than going through the studies, I'm just gonna read you uh, a page from, from my book, uh, which tells it this in more of a story type way. Uh, this is from a section called uh, Reasoning and Google Can Take You Wherever You Want to Go. Uh, when my son Max was three years old, I discovered that he's allergic to must. When I, when I would tell him that he must get dressed so that we can go to school, and he loved to go to school, he'd scowl and whine. The word must is a little verbal handcuff. It triggered in him the desire to score in three. The word can is so much nicer. Can you get dressed so that we can go to school? To be certain that these two words were really as different as night and day, I tried a little experiment. One night after dinner, I said, um, Max, you must eat ice cream now. And he said, I don't want to. <laughs> and then four seconds later, I said, Max, you can have some ice cream now if you want. He said, I want some. <laughs> uh, the difference between can and must is the key to understanding the profound effects of self-interest and group interest on reasoning. Um, it's also the key to understanding many of the strangest beliefs in UFO abductions, quack medical treatments, and conspiracy theories. The social psychologist Tom Gilovich at Cornell studies the cognitive mechanisms of strange beliefs. His simple formulation is that when we want to believe something, we ask ourselves, can I believe it? We then uh, look for evidence, and if we find even a single piece of pseudo-evidence, we stop thinking because we have a justification. In case anybody asks, why do you believe that? You can say, well, well, you know, I read this study, or I found that, or I just, whatever. Um, uh, in contrast, when we don't want to believe something, we ask ourselves, must I believe it? Then we search for contrary evidence, and if we find a single reason to doubt the claim, we can dismiss it, because you only need one key to unlock the handcuffs of must. Psychologists now have file cabinets full of findings on motivated reasoning, showing the many tricks that people use to reach the conclusions they want to reach. When subjects are told that an IQ test gave them a low score rather than a high score, and they're given the option of what to read, they choose to read articles uh, debunking the accuracy and worth of IQ tests. And conversely, if they got a high score, they then want to read about how good IQ tests are. Um, when people read a fictitious scientific study that reports a link between caffeine consumption and breast cancer, uh, and then they're asked to evaluate the study met for its methods, uh, these are psychology students who are given a study to read, who do you think finds flaws in the methods? Men or women? This is a study reporting the link between coffee consumption and breast cancer. Women. All women? Coffee drinking women. They think that a sample size of 30 inch cell is just not big enough. I mean, how can you really be sure? Um. <clears throat> or well, actually, for that kind of study, it's 300, let's say. But the point is, is things that were fine to, to women who don't drink coffee suddenly are flaws in the study uh, for women who drink coffee. Uh, the difference between a mind asking, must I believe it versus can I believe it is so profound that it even influences visual perception. Uh, so in one study, subjects are, they get points or which translate to money every time they can spot a letter appearing up on the screen. Uh, other times, it's, it, it's a number. So when one of the things flashed up is this, people who are being paid to spot letters see a B, whereas people being paid to spot numbers see a 13. Um, so if we can literally see what we want to see, as long as there's some ambiguity, is it any wonder that scientific studies often fail to persuade the general public. There is no such thing as a study you must believe. It is always possible to question methods, find an alternative in interpretation of the data, or if all else fails, question the honesty or ideology of the researchers. And now that we all have access to search engines on our cell phones, we can call up a team of supportive scientists for almost any conclusion 24 hours a day. Whatever you want to believe about the causes of global warming, or whether a fetus can feel pain, just Google your belief. You'll find partisan websites summarizing and distorting relevant scientific studies. 
Science is a smorgasbord, and Google will guide you to the dish that's right for you. Um, okay, so take one lesson from this part is this. You can't persuade people with reasons and evidence alone. That is, if they actually care about the issue. I mean, I could persuade you that it's faster to get from here to the airport by one road rather than another if you don't care. But if you already care about it, you're leaning one way, you have feelings, intuitions about it, um, then simply giving you evidence and arguments isn't going to change your mind. You need to change intuitions first. You need to get people to feel something before they can think it. Second implication is that each of us is flawed and biased in our reasoning. Our reasoning is not very good at finding the truth once self-interest or group interest uh, is at stake. Um, psychologists find over and over again that we are biased and they find it extraordinarily difficult to get people to overcome their biases. You can teach them this stuff, you can say, here's all the evidence, look at the crazy things people do, and yet they still say, okay, I see that he's biased, but me, I actually am uh, in the 90th percentile for driving ability, or whatever it is. Um, so a little bit of moral humility, I think, is, is really in order in all of our relationships with each other. Um, and the third point is that even though each of us is flawed, if you put us together in the right way, we're brilliant. And this is why science works so well. Because each scientist is, is not really dispassionately trying to seek the truth. We, we develop our models, we have our ideas, we're ego invested, we get uh, um, social rewards, uh, we argue for our side, there are limits. Um, but we're mostly trying to confirm our ideas, not disconfirm them. But the whole enterprise of science works because other people can disconfirm. And so as long as you have people on either side, then you have a healthy field. And science is generally very healthy. Uh, but I personally have been concerned that the field of social psychology sometimes gets it wrong. Because on matters of any political import, there's nobody on the other side. There are no conservatives. There's one, Rick McCauley, uh, at Bryn Mawr. But he's the only one that's been identified so far. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, we, we, so the social psychology as a field is generally healthy, but in certain areas, I think we don't do good thinking. Um, okay, on to the second point. There's more to morality than harm and fairness. Um, let's see. Now, um, in academic circles, raise your hand if you're in philosophy in any way, shape, or form. Wow, a lot of philosophers here. Okay, great. So, uh, philosophers, my sense is that philosophers tend to gravitate, and there's a lot of positions, but there are two major positions. One is about harm and, and utility, and others about uh, justice, rights, obviously Kant and, and, uh, um, and Mill. Uh, <coughs> uh, the, most of the theories I come across focus on harm, harm reduction. Uh, George Lakoff, for example, in describing uh, liberal morality, he says, behind every progressive policy lies a single moral value, empathy. Uh, the Dalai Lama has the same view, an ethical act is one which does not harm others' experience or expectation of happiness. Um, and I think this is why the Dalai Lama is so beloved uh, on, on the West Coast and certain cities on the East Coast, but nowhere else in the United States. Um, uh, Santa Fe, I think, probably. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the idea here is that um, uh, we, uh, there, well, my argument is that there's a lot more to morality than, uh, than just this. Um, clearly, concerns about care and harm are uh, basic. Uh, we are mammals. Uh, that, and that means to be a mammal means your brain and body are designed for caring. That's what mammalianism is. We're very good at caring. And uh, um, uh, this uh, is a, one of the most important foundations of, of morality. Um, and what I found in my research with my colleagues at yourmorals.org uh, is that this, everybody, everybody uh, uh, builds their morality on this foundation, everybody is concerned about others, but it's more so on the left. And so these are some photos I took at Occupy Wall Street, um, where even though a lot of it is about fairness, there's, I was surprised how, much, how many of the signs were about empathy, compassion. Uh, compassion is our new currency. I can't hurt another without hurting myself. There's a real sort of uh, you know, touchy-feely, lovey-huggy uh, feeling. Um, um, the second foundation uh, is uh, fairness and cheating. Uh, so this also, you will not find a human culture that doesn't care a lot about fairness, reciprocity, things like that. Um, but what we what we found is that you have to really think about this as um, proportionality. Uh, well, let me just show you. So on the, on the left, you do find, of course, arguments about fairness. I mean, liberalism is very much a critique of the inequality, the unfairness uh, of, of capitalist systems, of, of industrial capitalism, especially at Occupy Wall Street. But even there, what you find is that it's often mixed with compassion, marching for the meek and weary, hungry and homeless, tax the wealthy, fair and square. Um, on the left, you find a focus on fairness as equality, uh, often equality of outcomes. 
Um, so, uh, but on the right, it's very, very different. Uh, and so I'd be curious to know whether you see this in Canada too. Um, the Tea Party, for example, is very much about fairness. It's primarily about fairness, as far as I can tell. But it's fairness as proportionality. That is, people should get out in proportion to what they put in. And if some people are taking without giving, they're cheaters, they're slackers, they're free riders. We've we got to come down hard on them. And that's what launched the Tea Party, actually, was a rant uh, by Rick Santelli about bailing out homeowners who had uh, lied to get their mortgages and, got, and bought too much house, and now they're going bankrupt. And what, we're supposed to bail them out? No way. Um, so, uh, so the right in, in America, in the United States at least, is very much about, to, if I asked you, do you think he, this is a conservative or labor slogan? It's, it's quite clear. Um, this is a, a common theme of, of right-wing parties, that this kind of fairness. Uh, now the third foundation um, is uh, liberty and oppression. So in the United States at least, uh, we fetishize liberty. Uh, that we fetishize it because that was all the rhetoric of our founding. Give me liberty or give me death. Um, and you English, you Canadians seem to have been much more uh, uh, satisfied with being under the rule of the uh, oppressive monarch. But that's not <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so. Um, so I didn't know what to what to really uh, do with this because it wasn't really clear to me what the evolutionary logic. So I should point out the idea, what, what I've done here is I was so steeped in all this philosophical argument about there with uh, cultural psychology. Um, and back when I started this in 1990, in the early 1990s, hardly anybody was doing that. The evolutionists tended not to think anthropology was so important, and the anthropologists seemed maybe threatened by evolution, so that would be some reductionist thing that would essentialize differences and was just one step away from racism and social Darwinism. Um, so the two fields were not really talking. I was trying to uh, build bridges between them and say, what are, the, what, are the evol what are the psychological mechanisms that are just the best candidates for being products of evolution, but you also see them in some form all, all around the world? I should point out that um, uh, finally there, uh, there are scholars who are doing that. Most of them are here at UBC. You guys have the best psychology department, or the best group of people studying uh, uh, evolution and culture at the same time. Um, so now on to, so just to, to explain why my thinking changed here on, on liberty. Um, the, the breakthrough for me in thinking about liberty as a foundation of Aryan. So what is human nature? Um, oh, the other piece of the puzzle is that as soon as hunter-gatherers take up agriculture or settle down, instantly become hierarchical. So what is human nature? Uh, and many people, uh, many scholars uh, in anthropology and generally those who are on the left of the spectrum would prefer to believe that our nature is uh, egalitarian and we get corrupted by money, property, capitalism. Um, but Bohm says no. When you look at hunter-gatherers, they're not innately uh, egalitarian. What they are is they hate being bullied and dominated. They hate alpha males. So as soon as one guy tries to act like, oh, well, I'm the best hunter, so I should get more of the meat or more of the women. But the other guys gang up, and the women often support them with gossip and other means. Uh, people gang up, um, on, they gang up on the alpha male and take him down, either humiliate him, shame him, or if necessary, if you won't back down, then they kill him. So Bohm says that it's like we've got this sort of almost reflex, this like anti-bullying reflex. All right, this might sound kind of far away uh, off in hunter-gatherer uh, jungles, but it was only once I read this that I could understand the flag of my state. This is the flag of Virginia, the state of Virginia. It shows a murder. Isn't that weird? Why would you put a murder on the flag? Um, well, the slogan is Sit Semper Tyrannis, thus always to tyrants, which is what, uh, the, what, what uh, Marcus Brutus and the conspirators uh, shattered as they murdered Julius Caesar for being a tyrant, not the male. Uh, it's what John Wilkes Booth shattered as he assassinated Abe Lincoln for being a tyrant, dominating uh, the South. And it's what Timothy McVeigh, the guy who blew up the Oklahoma, the, the, that uh, right wing bomber who blew up the Oklahoma City uh, buildings in 1993, he had a t shirt that said Six Semper Tyrannus. So, this, this notion of burning hatred at, at being dominated by a foreign, by, by, a, by a bully, uh, it makes you want to kill. Um, I think this is a very deep and important moral reflex. And now I hope you can understand this image, which was very common on Occupy Wall Street. You had, you, you had that movement in Canada. It started was invented by Canadians, right? This, uh, so, uh, look at this image. Um, uh, it's, it, 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 it's a fist of the 99% about to crush the 1%. Now, most people uh, in academia and in the media love Occupy Wall Street and feel very positive towards it, but if you look at a lot of the iconography, it's like this. If we get together, we can kill them, we can crush them. We can, um, so there is, once you understand this as a psychological system, then I think it makes more sense. So, um, everybody favors liberty, at least in the United States. Uh, on the right, they favor liberty too, but now it's, um, it's, it, it still is opposing bullies, but it's seeing, seeing the government as a bully. 
Uh, so that's what the Tea Party is, is partially about. So to put this all together for you so far, we've got these three foundations of morality that, that I've talked about, not just care, but also fairness and also liberty. And at, at the website, what we find is when people register and they say that they're very liberal at the beginning, uh, when they register, they declare the politics, um, those people score very high on questions about care. So compassion for those who are suffering is the most crucial virtue. Uh, people on the far left endorse that um, uh, more strongly than people on the right, as you see the line slopes down. But if we look at a question about uh, equity, employees who work the hardest should be paid the most. It's not that liberals disagree with it, but they're only at they're about three, uh, whereas conservatives more strongly agree with that. Because that proportionality, fairness is proportionality. Um, and economic liberty, uh, all sides care about liberty, but economic liberty is especially on the right. People who are successful in business have a right to enjoy their wealth as they see fit. Okay, so um, so here's the story so far. On the left, what we find, uh, and this is not just true in America, we look at all the Canada, uh, the UK, Australia, and Western Europe, a lot of other countries. Um, what we find is that on the left, they value all three, but especially care. On the right, they value all three, but they're much more willing to trade off care for fairness and liberty. And this is right now what's happening in the United States with a healthcare law. Uh, should we compel people, should we violate their liberty to uh, uh, force them to buy a product so that a complicated system can work that will extend care to others? And people on the left say yes, people on the right say no. Um, this, well, I'll skip this. This is, it takes a little while to explain. Um, okay. it's, a, it's a long story about one of the craziest episodes in uh, recent American politics. Um, all right, the fourth foundation, uh, unless you want to hear it? Yes. Yeah. 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 I should just skip it without saying that. So, so some of you might even have heard about this. So there was a, uh, a Tea Party Republican debate last September, October, and Wolf Blitzer says, uh, if a healthy 30-year-old man chooses to forgo health insurance and then has an accident, goes into a coma, needs intensive care, who should pay? Uh, and he's questioning Ron Paul, the libertarian, as opposed to the government doing all this stuff. And Ron Paul says, well, that's what freedom's all about, taking your own risk. This whole idea that you have to take care of everybody. So libertarians in particular, we have a lot of data on this. They're the most analytical, rational, cold-hearted, unemotional people out there. Um, <laughs> um, and they endorse that reading of them. They're actually uh, proud of it. And, you know, I mean, they are the smartest, in terms of IQ and rational, they are actually the smartest of, of all the groups. Um, uh, so Ron Paul says, well, that's what freedom is all about. Uh, but Wolf Blitzer doesn't let him give this glib answer. He really presses him. He says, are you saying the society should just let him die? And then what made this seem famous is that three people in the crowd shouted out separately, yeah! <laughs> and that clip went viral uh, because people on the left sent around, what monsters these people are, these conservatives, they are just cruel, heartless bastards. Um, now Ron Paul, to his credit, gave a, a thoughtful, nuanced answer about charities and how in the old days he was a, you know, he was a doctor and we didn't let people die. So I don't think this, I think this actually redounded to Paul's credit, but the crowd, there was some sentiment in the crowd for letting the person die. Now, Really, what this story is, uh, what Wolf Blitzer was basically going for, was the ant and the grasshopper. You all, you all know the Aesop's fable? Well, raise your hand if you don't know this, the ant and the grasshopper. Uh, okay, so you know the, uh, the, the ants are working all summer to store away food, the grasshopper is fiddling, you know, fiddling his legs, making music, and says, oh, and you ants, you work too hard, come enjoy the summer with me, the days are long. And the ants say, no, gotta keep working, gotta keep working. Uh, and so then the winter comes around, and of course the ants are snug, uh, with their stores of grain, and the grasshopper is freezing to death, and he comes uh, and begs for food. And um, so the moral of the story, according to Aesop, is that the ants are supposed to give him food, right? Oh, I'm sorry, that's the liberal reading of it. Um, <laughs> what conservatives make of this story is that tough luck. You made your bed, you've got to lie in it. You chose to be a free rider, you, chose, you took the risk. This you know, young, young boy saying, I'm healthy, I don't need health insurance, why should I pay? You take the risk, so you should bear the consequences. Uh, so when, when, when the grasshopper comes and says care, uh, the ant's response is no, fairness and liberty. Um, so I think this is a real Rorschach test for one of the big left-right differences in the United States, and I'd be curious to know whether that's true in Canada too. Um, all right, so those are the three foundations that everybody values, but left and right use them differently. So um, I'd just like to end by reading uh, one, uh, one paragraph uh, from the book. Uh, morality binds and blinds. This is not just something that happens to people on the other side. We all get sucked into tribal moral communities, we circle around sacred values, and then share post hoc arguments about we are so right, why, why we are so right and they are so wrong. We think the other side is blind to truth, reason, science, and common sense, but in fact everyone goes blind when talking about their sacred objects. 
Morality binds us into ideological teams that fight each other as though the fate of the world depended on our side winning each battle. It blinds us to the fact that each team is composed of good people who have something important to say. Um, well, if politics is more like uh, religion than like shopping, is there any way to get us all into the same congregation? Well, yes. I, for one, am hoping for that asteroid. Thank you. <laughs>